Oh, it is such an honor and a privilege and a pleasure to be here. Um, it's, it is really, it is a special time for me. I, I thank Sherry so much for setting all this up and for being such a wonderful host and taking care of everything. You just do a beautiful job. Um, I thank Jody and Beth for allowing me to read with them. Your words moved me. So powerful. This is such an amazing program, and I've admired it for many, many years. First from afar, when I lived in Houston, heard about The Loft and its many programs and thought, this is a special thing. And then my husband and I moved here in 2003. I was, I was teaching at the U for a little while, and we would come here and, and hear folks read. And my own mentor from graduate school, Mark Doty, was in the mentor program many years ago. So I just am tickled to death to also be a part of that. Like Mark, you know, I, I'm not worthy, you know. <laughs> and when my first book came out, we had the book launch right here. I don't think I've read here since then. So it, this, it really feels like coming home in a lot of ways. Thank you all for being here tonight. So I'm going to read you some excerpts from um, an essay in my new book. And it is about Buddy Holly and the A-bomb. And if it doesn't make total sense, you know, just go with it. Just go with it. Because we're going to do some excerpts, and it all fits together, and the dates all work out. So just free your mind, you know? <laughs> free your mind. All right. And I have even enlisted some help from select audience members, so be ready for something different. <laughs> All right, damn cold in February. Buddy Holly, Viewmaster, and the A-bomb. Okay, so then when you get sent out to the test site, first of all, I'm curious what your impressions of that were, because you are now in the middle of a desert compared to a... It's damn cold. Yes, the desert's cold in the winter. In February, it's damn cold. First impression, cold. And it's dry. Except when it rains. Robert Martin Campbell, Jr., Atomic Veteran, Navy, describing his initial impression of the Nevada Proving Grounds, 1952. Click through the images, one at a time. View master atomic tests in 3D. You are there, reads the package. The set's reels show the preparations for the 1955 Apple II shot, its detonation, and the Nevada test site today. Three reels seven images each. Of the hundreds of atomic devices exploded at the Nevada test site from 1951 until 1992, the ones that stand out are those featuring Doomtown, a row of houses, businesses, and utility poles. It makes sense. The flash, the wall of dust, and the burning yuccas are impressive on their own, but without something familiar in the frame, the explosion can seem abstract. Doomtown, also called Survival City, or Terror Town, makes the bomb anything but theoretical. These are the images I can't forget. Click. Here's Doomtown's iconic two-story house, a classic colonial with shuttered windows balancing a front door. Neat and tidy, with white painted siding and a sturdy red brick chimney. If this were your house, you'd probably feel pretty good about yourself. But something's wrong. The vehicle parked in the drive isn't a Dodge or a Packard, but an army Jeep. On the chimney's edge, a bloom of spray paint shows the siding was painted in a hurry. This is a house nobody will ever live in. Its only inhabitants are mannequins with eyes like apple seeds. All part of the plan, and the planning took far longer than the event itself. A crew unloaded telephone poles, jockeyed them upright, and drilled them into the alluvium. Down in Vegas, men bargained for cars and stood in line for sets of keys. Imagine the hitch and roar of a 46 Ford, 51 Hudson, 48 Buick, and 47 Olds as they pull onto the highway, headed for the proven grounds. Click. Here's one of the cars now, a pale blue 49 Cadillac with 46 painted on its trunk in numbers two feet tall, marked like an entrant in a demolition derby. You could say the whole country pitches in. Fenders pressed from Bethlehem steel, lumber skidded out of South Georgia piney woods, glass insulators molded in West Virginia, slacks loomed and pieced and surged in Carolina mills. And mannequins made in Long Island, crated and stacked and loaded onto rail cars. Click. In an upstairs bedroom, a soldier tucks a mannequin woman into a narrow bed, the mattress's navy ticking visible beneath the white sheet. 
Outside the open window, the white blare of the desert at noon. Downstairs, another soldier arranges a family, seating adults around a table and positioning children on the floor, checking the dog tags around each of their necks. What's a plan but a story, set not in the past but the future? Someone in the Civil Defense Administration already decided how many mannequins this house will hold, what they'll wear, whether they'll sit or stand. But surely this soldier can allow himself the freedom to choose, say, which game the children on the floor will play. For brother and little sister, how about Jack's? A good indoor game. And big sister, let's set her off from the rest, next to her portable record player, its cord lying on the floor like a limp snake. Father leans toward the television, one hand on his knee and the other on the pipe resting in the hole drilled in his lip. The blank television reflects his face. He could be watching the news. In 1945, Manhattan Project physicists exploded the first atomic device, Trinity, in the desert outside Alamogordo. A little more than two weeks later, the Enola Gay dropped Little Boy on Hiroshima. And three days after that, Boxcar dropped Fat Man on Nagasaki. Scientists predicted that the United States' monopoly on atomic weapons would hold for at least 20 years. But in 1949, the Soviets proved them wrong, exploding a bomb named First Lightning. In response, Harry Truman authorized the building of Mike, the first hydrogen bomb tested in the South Pacific. The logistics of testing so far away made the process costly, so a public relations campaign was conducted in order to convince Americans that testing closer to home, at the Nevada test site, an hour or so north of Las Vegas, was desirable and safe. By and large, the public got on board with this campaign, and although much of the evidence generated by the test was kept classified for decades, the Department of Defense and the Atomic Energy Commission made it a priority to publicize some of the information. Broadcasts of the tests were shown on television, newspaper reporters and photographers documented them, and civilians were encouraged to witness the explosions. In the summer of 1957, an article in the New York Times explained how to plan one summer vacation around the non-ancient but nonetheless honorable pastime of atom bomb watching. Reporter Gladwin Hill wrote that, for the first time, the Atomic Energy Commission's Nevada test program will extend through the summer tourist season into November. It will be the most extensive test series ever held, with upward of 15 detonations. And for the first time, the AEC has released a partial schedule so that tourists interested in seeing a nuclear explosion can adjust itineraries accordingly. Hill's article suggests routes, vantage points, and film speeds so that the atomic tourists can capture the spectacle. But is there anything to fear from watching an atomic explosion? Rest assured, he says, that there is virtually no danger from radioactive fallout. A car crash is the bigger threat, possibly caused by the bomb's blinding flash or by the excitement of the moment when people get careless in their driving. In the article's last paragraph, Hill writes, a perennial question from people who do not like pre-dawn expeditions is whether the explosions can be seen from Las Vegas, 65 miles away. The answer is that sometimes enough of a flash is visible to permit a person to say he has seen an atomic bomb. But it is not the same as viewing one from relatively close range, which generally is a breathtaking experience. That summer, after winning the title of Miss Atomic Bomb, a local woman poses for photos <laughs> with a cauliflower-shaped cloud based to the front of her bathing suit. <laughs> Thanks to trick photography, she seems to tower over the salt flats on endless legs, power lines brushing her ankles. With her arms held high above her head, the very shape of her body echoes the mushroom cloud. And her smile looks even wider because of the dark lipstick outlining her mouth, a ragged circle like a blast radius. Not only do Americans want to see the bomb, we want to become it, shaping our bodies to fit its form. A studious looking young man who totes his electric guitar like a sawn off shotgun. Review of a Buddy Holly performance in Birmingham, England, March 11th, 1958. There's a lot going on during that atomic summer. Buddy Holly, for instance. 
His career's taken off by 1957, thanks to hits like That'll Be the Day, Peggy Sue, and Every Day, songs that combine country inflections with rock's insistent rhythm. He looks ordinary, like someone you went to high school with. In fact, you were born knowing him, the bird-chested guy, sexless and safe. But look more closely at the story of how he gets into a scuffle with his buddy, Joe B., the bass player, before a show, and Joe B. accidentally knocks off Buddy's two front caps. Buddy solves the problem by smearing a wad of chewing gum across the space, sticking the caps back on and playing the gig. Or at the story of how he met dark-haired Maria Elena in a music publishing office, and that same day asked her to marry him, and she said yes. Or look at this, a clip from a TV show he played in December of 57. Now, if you haven't heard of these young men, the hostess says, then you must be the wrong age, because they're rock and roll specialists. <laughs> the camera's trained on Buddy, and he doesn't waste time. If you knew Peggy Sue, then you'd know why I feel blue, giving it everything he's got. And as he moves into the second verse, the camera on stage right goes live, and he pivots smoothly, keeping up. I'm staring back from better than 50 years out, watching as he follows the camera with a studied intensity magnified by the frenetic speed of his strumming. His fingers are a blur, but he doesn't make mistakes. And as I watch the clip, I'm startled by the distinctly handsy look in his eye. This is not what I expected. The whole song's a revelation, from the rapid fire drumming to the stuttering, pretty, 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 Peggy Sue to the way his falsetto warps the words of the last verse. With a love so rare and true. You know he doesn't mean a word of it. <laughs> <laughs> He's just telling you what you want to hear. And that tamped down sex, how had I missed it, burns in his eyes. And there's something about the way he stares at the camera that sets him apart from his contemporaries. Elvis, the Big Bopper, Johnny Cash, all play to the audience since they have at the time mugging for the camera and making the kids squeal. Jerry Allison, the drummer for the Crickets, said later that playing on TV made him nervous. That was something different, he said, an audience that wasn't there. But watching Buddy, you'd never know it. He's playing to the fans of the future, to the camera, to now. We just hoped somebody would buy our records so we could go on the road. And play. Nikki Sullivan, rhythm guitarist for the Crickets. Sometimes it must seem he's never known anything but life on this bus, its engine groaning up the grade of every back road in the upper Midwest, his clothes wrinkled and ripe in the bags overhead, his hands tucked under his armpits for warmth. When the bus breaks down again and the heater conks out, they burn newspapers in the gritty aisle between the seats to try and stay warm. Carl, the drummer, gets frostbite and has to go to the hospital. He's a fill-in. Joe B. and Jerry are back in Lubbock. But Buddy needs the money. On cloudy days after snow falls, you can't tell where the fields end and the sky begins. And the fences down the section lines must be a comfort to him. Iowa's a long way from Texas, but at least the barbed wire tells you what's solid and what's not. They all play the show in Clear Lake and gear up for Moorhead. Nearly 400 miles away, a full night's ride in that freezing bus, and probably another breakdown on the side of the road. Why not charter a plane instead? Then he'll get to the next gig in plenty of time, have a hot shower, do everyone's laundry. The Beechcraft seats three plus the pilot. He's in for sure, and JP, sick with the cold. Richie and the guitar player flip for the last seat, and Richie wins. See you when we see you. And I'm not married yet, and I haven't got sense enough to realize the magnitude. You see it visually, but it's beautiful. It's beautiful, just gorgeous. The colors that are emitted out of this ball of mass, and the higher it goes into the air, it becomes an ice cap on top because it's getting so high, and it's just a beautiful ice cap. Robert Martin Campbell Jr. describing Tess George the thermonuclear detonation he witnessed in the Marshall Islands on May 9th, 1951. The plane's thin door clicks shut. Past midnight and Buddy's beat. The pilot turns the knobs and checks the instruments and the engine roars its deafening burr. 
When he looks out the windshield, there's nothing to see but snow, swirling in the lit cone thrown by the hangar lights. Slowly at first, then faster, the plane rolls down the runway and lifts off. Up and bouncing in the air pockets, the roar of the engines, no way to talk and be heard, but he's too tired to talk anyway. Three miles out, then four, then five. When do they realize something's wrong? Does the pilot panic, trying to read the dials, not understanding what they say? The windshield's a scrum of snow, white swirl black, no way to tell up from down, and headed for the ground at 170 miles an hour. The plane's shaking hard, going fast, and this gyroscope measures direction in exactly the opposite way from the instruments the pilot had known before. What does it feel like? You can't trust your senses when you're this beat, this far from home, and all you know for sure is that your bones hurt from hunching into the cold. One day you're playing the opening of a car dealership outside town, the next you're leaving the movies with your friends, the next you're on the Arthur Murray party, standing in front of a girl in a strapless ball gown the color of winter wheat. She'll stand there the whole time, swaying gently, looking over your shoulder at America and wearing a little smile that says, there is nothing better than this. To be here in this place, young, feeling this song in your body, warm inside the theater while outside the wind blows, louder and louder, sneaking its way in through any crack it can find and shrieking now in your ear, higher and colder and harder and harder until finally it stops. Live a bucolic life in the country, far from a potential target of atomic blasts, for destruction is everywhere. Houses destroyed, mannequins representing humans torn apart and lacerated by flying glass. Las Vegas Review Journal, May 6, 1955. It could be any cornfield, any stretch of snow. What's left isn't recognizable as a plane, and the dark shapes on the ground don't look like bodies, although they must be. The coroner's broad back is dark against the white as he leans over to take their measure. The thin snow crusting the ground makes everything look even colder. There's a shape a few yards distant that looks like someone trying to crawl away. You know it's a lie. They didn't have a prayer. Time to clean up. Down in Las Vegas, employees at car dealerships sweep up window glass that had been shattered by the blast 65 miles away. Someone dumps the pieces in a barrel and starts charging for them. Atomic souvenirs. They sell out by day's end. In Doomtown, cars lie flipped onto their tops or burned where they stand. Telephone poles are snapped in half, their lines a snarled mass. I watch a clip from test film number 33. A camera pans down a line of mannequins staked to poles in the open desert. Their clothes wave in the breeze. Do you remember this young lady? The narrator asks. This tattoo mark was left beneath the dark pattern. As she speaks, the hand of an unseen worker lifts the skirt a modest few inches, smoothing the slip to show how the heat seared a design onto the fabric beneath. And this young man? This is how the blast charred and faded the outer layer of his new dark suit. The same worker's hand, a wedding band gleaming on one broad finger, pushes the cloth back to reveal the lapel shadow seared on the mannequin's chest. And then he smooths the lapel back in place. For a brief moment, he presses his ungloved palm to the mannequin's shoulder, as if to say, there you go, you did your best. Such a slight gesture, here and gone, he probably didn't give it any thought. But it moves me, his moment of pity for even this mute copy of a man. When asked what American Pie meant, McLean replied, it means I don't ever have to work again. <laughs> Alan Howard, the Don McLean story, killing us softly with his songs. Does Buddy go on the road to sell records, or does he sell records to go on the road? Does he savor these giddy minutes of getting ready in a strange place, cement floor dressing rooms with chipped green paint, hand-me-down dressers, and mirrors fastened to the wall with daisy-shaped rivets? He carries with him what he needs. Guitar strings, fuses, handkerchiefs, nail file, pencil stub, safety pins. Nobody ever has one. He could make a fortune if he started a new safety pin factory. The world desperately needs more. 
and outside the scurf of people talking, waiting for the show, waiting for him. Waiting for him, Maria Elena, back in their little apartment, lighting the pilot on the stove and talking to her mother in a warm haze of gas fumes and soup. Blue feathers of flame under the pot, telephone on the wall, push button to light the kitchen. All of these cost money. The honeymoon in Acapulco. The property in Bobolet Heights. He signed his real name on the deed, Charles Buddy Holly, with an E. The stage manager says it's time, high time. He finds his mark, waits for the curtain, and when the stagehand hauls it up, he can't hear the creaking of the rope for the screams, and he's playing the first chords of Peggy Sue without even realizing it, diving deep into a pool. Feeling the crowd stomping through the soles of his feet, shaking with the bass like he's hooked to it, and between songs, he has to take off his glasses and wipe the sweat from his eyes. Hey, he says, we sure are glad to be here. The crowd's a blur, but he can see the mic, its woven mesh familiar as his own fingerprint. That's better. Slides the glasses on, looks back. Oh boy, do you think? When you're with me, the world can see that you were meant for me. Every day, it's a getting closer, going faster than a roller coaster. Buddy Holly, Every Day, 1957. Southern Paiute and Western Shoshone lived, once, on the land that became the Nevada test site. But by now, clicking through this third reel, the test site today, it's hard to believe anyone ever lived under this acid sun at noon. Here's one of the few doomed town houses still standing, its siding burned brown, windows empty. Here's a bank vault slung the length of two football fields. Here's a shot tower, never used, abandoned after the moratorium in 92. Tumbleweeds rest on the broken tarmac against the guardhouse. It all looks so ordinary. The orange plastic webbing seen in countless construction zones, the ground bristling with rusty rebar. If you stare at these things, even from this remove, you carry something of them with you. Brilliant blue sky. The dust the photographer breathed, close now is the tongue in your mouth. Turn the knob of your own front door and observe how it smokes in the heat's first blast. Stand at the kitchen sink and watch the window bow inward and break, the eyelet curtain tumbling out and tearing free. Wake suddenly from your last dream to the fireball's flash and realize the shock wave is coming. We'll be here in a single second's tick. Click. The guitar case snaps shut. Click. He opens a stiff new pair of glasses. Click. Dog tags rattle in the soldier's hand. Click. A photographer documents the crash scene. Click. The arm of the record player drops a 45 on the turntable. Click. A soldier stacks cans in the pantry, bottom to rim. What's still there in that dark, silent room? A stray jug of water, an empty coffee cup. In a crack of the floor, a safety pin. All I got here is a bunch of dead man's clothes to wear. The Searchers, 1956. That'll be the day. When Ethan Edwards says it, it's cynical. He's seen it all and none of it's good. But in Buddy's voice, the words change. Baby, I got your heart, he's saying. You ain't gonna leave me. It'd kill me if you did. You know that. He's brave but vulnerable too, and maybe that's his gift, turning bitterness into hope, an alchemy possible only because he's so young, clean cut, the favorite son. Will you say goodbye? Will I cease to be? Not a chance. Close your eyes. They're in the studio in Clovis, in rooms close in summer and drafty in winter, a studio that was formerly a grocery store, smelling of paint and mice. He sits in a corner, threading a fresh string onto the guitar and tightening it, adjusting, tightening again. Meanwhile, Jerry's working on the drum part. Norman Petty, the producer, says, that cha-cha isn't going to work, and he's right. He charges not by the hour, but by the song, and they like that. Gives you time to get it right. They try different things until they hit on the idea of paradiddles. Taka, 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 taka. A rhythm that rolls like breakers. And when they try a take, they have to wait because a passing truck makes the windows rattle. Outside, it's a hundred dark miles back to Lubbock and nobody's in the mood to quit. Grab dinner, come back and work some more. 
and later they'll stretch out on the narrow beds and back and sleep. Maybe sometime during the night, one of those big old thunderstorms rolls up out of the west, and maybe they stand outside the studio and watch it come. Forks of cloud to ground lightning, silhouette long reefs of cloud, flashing on 18-wheelers barreling toward Vegas with a ways yet to go. Arc, crack, boom. Moist wind presses the boys against the wall, the smoke from their cigarettes swirling around their heads and shunting up into the downdraft. Time stops cold in moments like this. Everything sharper in the strange light, the ambient electricity strong enough to raise the hair on your arms. Rain on gravel, hot smoke in your throat. When they say, we better go in, you say, give me a minute. Lean against the still warm cinder block and feel the storm coming. If it's got your number, ain't nothing you can do. It's late by now, the night almost gone, but you're swinging with caffeine and nicotine and a head full of notions. Inside, your friends are waiting, and there's a seat with your name on it. Soon you'll walk through that door, an explosion now from close by and closer still. Not yet, not yet, now. Does it really happen like that? You bet your life it does. Thank you.